this has been a week, an interesting week. We've got this story that you're about to hear with our our gringo loco getting picked up from prison by the mafia boss cop. That's how we left off last episode. And he's pretty certain he's about to die. Well, spoiler alert, <laughs> he, he didn't die. But um, more ups and downs continue. And uh, he pretty, hit a pretty low low here. But more of these kind of, oh, and this happened, and that happened, and this person, and that band. <laughs> more of this just unbelievable stuff that, you know, is it so unbelievable that you have to believe it? Or is it, is it that just an incredible coincidence that he's woven all these things together in his mind? <laughs> is it a true story? It continues to be the, the kind of main question along the way. And the other thing, I promised you interviews with different people that knew Sean along the way, but it's funny how many people were okay with it in, on an initial conversation and now when it's time to talk and put it on the record, even if we're keeping names apart, they're uh, hesitant to. And, uh, you know, multiple people have found excuses to excuse themselves from sharing their memories of our gringo loco. It uh, makes me wonder if I'm loco for doing this. Am I putting myself in danger? Or is it just they don't want, to, you know, their friends and loved ones to know maybe? Some of the things they did with Sean, who knows? Um, but that's a little disappointing. But I think, I think I'm pretty close to getting Sean. Honestly, um, I'm hoping that within the next couple of weeks there could be contact. I don't want to. I probably shouldn't have said it. I don't want to jinx it, but I'm hoping so. Well, this episode, like I said, you know, it starts off in a pretty tense moment in Gringo Loco's life, and uh, it takes you through a lot more up and downs ups and downs and at the end i'll tell a story about a time uh that seemed pretty dark for sean when i knew him and that uh that we went and and tried to cheer him up a little bit but uh it was kind of scary for a bit i'll tell you all about that after this enjoy season one episode nine dean never said what a word about it to me, to the police and the judge, always claiming I was just a hitchhiker and knew nothing. I was impressed, as well as the cartel and mafia. Upon release, I was picked up by the meat man, a policeman, also with the mafia. I thought at that moment, upon finally being released, from jail, like that wasn't enough, but now I was even worse, dead for sure. Taking off my orange jumpsuit and handcuffs, finally receiving my own street clothes, the ones I had been arrested in, stinky from sweating bullets at the time. And after so much time in prison, it was a relief to put them on and await my release. Looking at the bread man was a relief either way. When it sunk in, I'd rather go out the outside and only fitting the same way with the mafia, with the meat man. We all have to go sometime. We're all living on borrowed time anyway. I had expected the cons, consequences for my actions. And out of all the people in the world, the one who brought me into this planet with first Frank Sinatra, then the Italian mafia, my bodyguard from the Mexican cartel, all this was hanging on my shoulders. I thought, if worse came the worse, it would be a great weight lifted from my shoulders. And if I had to die, it'd be better from the hands 
of a professional, the meat man. Being escorted out of Sing Sing prison by the meat man, showing the badge he had to the other policemen. I was led outside to find his black Cadillac waiting with his bodyguard and driver. I was told to get in the back seat to sit alongside my boss. The meat man and the chauffeur closed the door behind him to get behind the driver's wheel and take off. Just the three of us in the middle of nowhere. I thought it was just a matter of time. Here we were driving in the middle of nowhere. Just out of this shithole town in the middle of fucking nowhere called Gonzales. My worst nightmare almost coming to an end in my mind. I was sitting there in my seat, not saying a word. Nobody did. And I wasn't going to start the conversation. I have a tendency to dig a hole with each word. It's sad. It's a bad habit. But it's true. Finally, what seemed to be eternity, my boss spoke in his always stern, low voice. I'm very disappointed in you. I was about to say sorry, and he told me not to interrupt while he was speaking, as he did to me nearly 20 years earlier when I was just a snot-nosed kid at the age of 15 years old. After being scolded by the meat man, the last words I remember in the conversation, thinking I'm dead after. I kept my mouth shut and heard from his lips coming out of his mouth that because of Dean taking the prison sentence of five years, keeping his mouth shut, like you, not mentioning a thing about the mafia and the Mexican cartel. We are all impressed with the two of you. You both kept your end of the deal, did the crime and the time. Your word is gold, as mine. If a man doesn't have, have his word, He has nothing at all. I'm giving my word to you that only one more chance remains for you. Nothing's going to happen to you or your family for this very expensive mistake, not only in material, money, but respect. Most people in your position would be erased for this. You know that more than anyone. I put my neck out for you, bringing you into the family. And this organization, John Gotti in New York City, all the way from here in California got the news and is furious. This is no way to do business as the Godfather said. Your lives on the line, not mine. It's your mistake, but my responsibility. Get your shit together, man. You're no longer a boy. You're living in a man's world. Now I need you to pay for your mistake, as did I, to cover your ass. The only reason I did it is because you're like a son to me after 20 years, bringing you in as only a child, but there's something special about you. But putting that aside, I need you to pay me back, all of it. I told him I have $100,000 in cash in the bank in my safety deposit box. 
Let's go there now. We can make it back to San Francisco before it closes. The good gesture was only to cover a portion of the loss. As you remember, the material was worth twice that. I told him that I would work it off. This was all I could do at the time. I needed time to do it, and we all agreed on the terms. I was escorted to where I was living before. This unfortunate incident, my bro, had heard what happened to me, as did everyone in the grapevine. My, gro my bro, kind enough to pay my rent with my friend and his, the owner of the house. He was a huge musician with techno music, the godfather of this new sensation. Having raves in clubs in San Francisco and the Bay Area, I would do the light shows for many of these events. The first of its kind, like many things coming out of this great city, I was also offered a job through a mutual friend, Dano, his rich girlfriend, older than he was, was a world-renowned art gallery owner in San Francisco. She gave me an opportunity to open and close this art gallery seven days a week and clean her penthouse once a week, that I can make $100 a day plus commission. Also $100 for cleaning the big, elegant, beautiful apartment and gallery. The art gallery was called Carol Christensen Fine Arts, selling Andy Warhol, Peter Max, and all of Andy's friends had their artwork in my gallery along with not only the best pop artists in the world, but also abstract artist sensation, Rauschenberg, Kuntz, and Pollock. I was selling all the lithographs in and out like hotcakes. I was a great salesman, but the artwork obviously spoke for itself. I was able to pay back the money I owed the family in no time. I finally had a clean slate, my life no longer in danger. I paid my debt, all of it. Working in the art world was amazing and I'm forever grateful to its owner. Always honest, hard working, I rearranged the art gallery with his fine art on the wall, paintings, lithographs, also not only Andy Warhol's famous soup can lithographs, but the cans themselves. Only a limited number of them in the world. I remember selling lithos for more or less $5,000 and the soup can for $250,000. That's a quarter million dollars for an Andy Warhol soup can. I delivered it myself. That's how much trust Carol had with me in the art gallery, not to mention millions of dollars worth of artwork in the gallery with me, having the key to lock and unlock every day. I had respect, honesty, and honor. I remember it was Friday the 13th, my bro's birthday. We decided to go back to Oakland of all places. This is where my bro wanted to go. We went to his favorite donut shop, in the world 
a hole-in-the-wall place where we were the only white boys in this place. Previously living around the corner, he and I, we played Kino, Lotto, the lottery, drank hot coffee, ate hot chocolate donuts just coming out of the oven. Here it was his birthday, so I handed him a $1 bill to play the California lottery. Before both of our eyes, as we saw the balls, with the numbers drop what seemed to be in slow motion, all seven of his numbers came up. It was a birthday miracle on what is known around the world universally, Friday the 13th, a bad luck day. My bro won the fucking California lottery. We were in shock. Like, holy shit, what just happened in this small little donut shop in Oaktown? My brother asked the owner, how do we get the money? Here's my winning ticket. The owner couldn't believe it. That's the ticket I just sold you. You just bought it in my face. You won the lottery. So have I, the owner replied. The government gives me 5%. Go to the main lottery office in Sacramento, California, obviously the capital, and there you will receive your money. After showing and giving them your winning ticket and doing some paperwork, be sure to bring your ID, your identification. Get going for your money. What are you waiting for? It's only a couple hours drive. Congratulations and happy birthday. We got in the car and that's what we did. Went to get the big paycheck. After receiving the money, my bro gave me back my dollar that I had given him to win the lottery with. I told him, that's it? You should give me half. You're joking, right? This is it, a dollar. No bets go to Las Vegas. Tell you what, we're going in a limo. We're going to fly first class and stay at the best hotels. We're going to eat and drink, gamble like the kings that we are. My bro was on fire at the Fitzgerald's, his favorite casino. He hit the jackpot three sevens in a row, $10,000. He threw me 10 racks, that's $1,000, $100 each. Playing the dollar machines, I told him, I wanted to go to Harrah's Casino across the street and find some luck there because you're dominating here. He said, whatever, I'm not going anywhere. I know I'll see you in a bit. Going to Harrah's with Johnny, who came along with us after not being together for so long. I changed my tokens for dollars, receiving myself of carrying around 10 racks of slot coins. They're heavy. And turn them into cash. Walking in the casino, I asked for two racks, inviting Johnny to one. I sat down at what I thought was to be a good machine. An old lady just got up from it and looked like she had been playing it for a while, just getting it hot and ready for me to play with and win. It wasn't a few coins later that I did just that. I hit the jackpot, $5,000, 
bells ringing, lights flashing. It was music to my ears. The sound of money as the coins hit the tray falling out of the machine. The casino manager came to congratulate me and had the photographer take a picture of Johnny and I in front of the slot machine. As he handed me $5,000, I still have the picture to this day. I took my winnings with Johnny and said, let's go show my bro. The money, he's not the only one around here with good luck. Walking back across the street from Harrah's to the Fitz, my bro was still on the same machine. He could sit on a slot machine for days at a time. I showed him the picture and the money. He was happy for me. It's about time you had some good luck. See what you can do here in the fits. Play a while here. I don't want to jinx what you have going here. I'm going to play by the main entrance. They usually put good machines close to the street so the people that pass by can see it's a winning casino. I did just that. There were only a few machines, three of them, an old lady on one and the Mexican that looked like he just crossed the border with all due respect. Anyway, the three of us playing together with me in the middle like a sandwich. It felt like a competition. Who would win first? All of a sudden, the guy to my right hit the big one, jackpot. The sirens and lights going off. And so did the Mexican running out of the casino as if immigration was after him or something. I yelled at him, you just won $1,600. What are you doing? He was gone so fast and I have moved quickly to his chair in front of the winning slot machine, claiming it to be mine right away. The old lady telling me she wanted it, I told her to get the hell away from me and here right now or I'll kill you. She took her money from her machine with a quickness and did just that. Then the manager came over and said, congratulations, you just won $1,600 and paid me in cash in $100 bills. Johnny by my side once again, I had hit two slot machines in two casinos back to back. It was a payday. I told him to tell my bro that I was going to take the money and run in case they see on the cameras or videotape what really happened. Officially, it wasn't my win. I'm going to the Mirage. You and my bro meet me there, near the main entrance. I'll be playing the slots there. Later, we were all together once again. Good times. Deciding to place bets on the NFL, football, watch some games, go shopping, take in a show. We had a really good time. Went to the restaurant, had a good meal and a couple of drinks afterwards, getting a sweet complimented plus the food and drinks by the hotel, knowing Johnny and his family relations. With the hotel, seeing this place more than all of us put together. This was his home away from home. He was a rock star, very well known, and on the VIP list at the Mirage Hotel Casino. The next morning, we decided to fly back to San Francisco, leaving Las Vegas. 
Let's take our winnings and go. We did just that. Arriving at San Francisco Airport, Johnny went to Los Gatos. My bro, San Francisco, as well as I, only shortly after, deciding to try my luck in Marin County one last time. This would be like baseball. Strike three and you're out. It would later be my final downfall. I got a place in Petaluma, California, a small town in the middle of nowhere. I was hanging out with a bunch of tweakers. They're like magnets to me. They stick to me like glue. I thought living in a small town, I could get away from it. I met a bunch of my bro's friends. One lived in his parents' garage. His dad was director of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, San Francisco. He had arrested Patty Hearst in the 70s. It made all the papers. Like a lot of people, I knew they were rock stars. He was one of them. You wouldn't think so. This guy still living at home with his parents. Another really good friend of mine and my brother was Butter. He was called that because his fingers moved smooth as hot butter on the guitar. He could do things that nobody could do. He always was a ladies man, had the most beautiful girlfriends. Speaking of which, I met Amy, blonde hair, natural by the way. Blue eyes, 36 double D, 5'4", like a Barbie doll. Only she was the biggest tweaker in Marin. She lived in a house in San Rafael, only 20 minutes from Petaluma, where I was living. She was a friend of my bro, but really good friends with Amy's brother. The mom was a nurse at a nearby hospital. Everyone was cool with me practically living there. Amy was my girlfriend. The family was one of the biggest distributors of glass in all of Marin County. Big client of my bros with the Hells Angels. This family also had a pretty big gang itself. All a bunch of crazy ass white boys dominating Marin. I mean all of it. No joke. And my new girlfriend only answering to her mom was the boss. Amy was so in love with me. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't. I didn't feel the same. Always being such a nice guy before in love. I was now somewhat of an asshole. I just didn't care about her or anything else. People told me I should be nicer to her. She is the queen of Marin. I was nice to her, and as I look back, I should have been nicer. It was a crazy time, this period of time, in my life, in the 1990s. As if it wasn't crazy enough. But one thing led to another, and everything was lost. The gang had stolen everything I had. I was cleaned out, sent to the cleaners. All my possessions, money, everything I had in Petaluma, while I was living with Amy in San Rafael, it turned out to be her brother's friends, tweakers, in the gang. I also lost Amy as fast as I had her. I was now homeless, living in an abandoned boat in Sausalito, California, Gate 6, back where everyone was angry at me before for supposedly robbing the local store. Time had passed since that incident, and word had finally gotten around about my innocence. It was actually the same that just robbed me. 
that did the same thing to me before. Sometimes I have really bad luck. When it rains, it pours. I woken up early in the morning with a guy tying up his rowboat to my abandoned boat close to shore. He told me he was anchored out between Sausalito and Tiburon, a rich little town almost like an island of paradise right in front of our eyes so close to San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge. So close, but yet a lifetime away, completely out of reach. This way of life for me at the moment. But just when I thought it couldn't get worse, this guy offered me a place to live on his boat. He said it was small as he pointed it out to me, showing me obviously from a distance with his finger. It was a two bedroom, so I could have my own space. It was certainly better than nothing, which is what I had at the time, so I took it. The boat had electricity with cables connected to a car battery, which was what he had in his hands. He asked me to go with him to charge it, because it was dead. He told me I could work with him around the docks doing various projects that he had every day. He was a local handyman. I would later become his assistant and make a little bit of money and be able to pay some rent and eat. We had a gas stove, a radio, a TV with one light, The car battery, once charged, would last a week long with a small tank of gas we had for the stove. This guy loved to party and I didn't. I had learned my lesson. As far as I was concerned, the party was over. So was my relationship living with the crazy guy on the small boat in the middle of the ocean. I decided to go back to San Francisco with what little I had at the time. And time passes so fast like it always does with me. Life goes by in a blink of an eye. It's that fast. I had lost contact with my bro, his friends, and mine. I found myself homeless, back where I started my childhood. I remembered as a kid going to Glide Memorial Church with the Reverend Cecil Williams. I thought I could ask him for some help. The church did just that, giving me food and shelter. It was a God blessing, gold at the time. It wasn't easy there. Always a long line to wait in to receive a place to finally be able to sit down and eat alongside a lot of other homeless people. I wasn't the only one who had fallen upon difficult times. Believe me. And that was only half the battle because the line was even longer to wait and see if you are lucky enough to get a place to sleep with the limited space and beds that they had. Sometimes I wouldn't get a a bed along with the other people waiting in line. For one, we were all told by Reverend Cecil Williams himself that he was sorry, but the church was full. And that time was no more room. This would mean for me, along with a lot of other homeless, that we would be sleeping on the streets. I found myself going to Golden Gate Park, finding some grass underneath the trees. I was awoken in the morning, 
seeing what looked to be like a size 12 army boot in my face. There was a gang of homeless people kicking my ass. The last thing I remember was that boot stomping me in the face as two others held me down only to have three other guys punching my ribs and stomach. The boot coming down on my face the fourth or fifth time broke my nose and I fell unconscious. I was knocked out. I must have been what seemed to be like a coma to wake up hours later in a pool of blood, everything stolen. Like before in Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, I had my misfortune and once again was fortunate enough to have Becky walking by barely noticing me from the beating I had received. My face was black and blue, puffy, somewhat deformed from the broken nose and blood. I was a mess in more ways than one. She told me I didn't look good and that my bro was living with her and the band called Four Non Blondes. We lived just around the corner on Haight and Ashbury Street above the Chinese restaurant. Let's go. Can you make it? She lifted me from the ground, lifting me up and held on to me as we made it back to the Haight-Ashbury district next to an abandoned movie theater that the band Smashing Pumpkins would later have their concert in. It was a long flight of steps up to the apartment. It was huge, five bedrooms. Becky yelled for my bro to see what the cat had just dragged in. My bro was shocked to see me after so long. But worse was the shape I was in. What the fuck happened to you, bro? You're a fucking wreck. I've been looking everywhere for you. Everyone has. Let's get you fixed up. Here you can sleep on the couch for a while. But Roach sleeps there now that he's broken up with Becky. The girls band had a falling out with the bass player. Roach has an audition with Four Non Blondes in the studio tomorrow. He complaining about not only giving up his guitar for a bass, but doesn't want to play in a girl band. He says he's a man, but look at him sleeping on his couch. All the rooms are taken. The house is filled up to this couch. Becky overhearing the conversation and being not only the owner of the apartment, but her dad was the owner of the world famous Hotel California. You know the band, the Eagles, their famous song, the Hotel California. Anyway, Becky offered me the walk-in closet in the kitchen. There's no freeloaders here. You'll have to pay $40 a month. That's $10 a week. This closet was six feet squared, not big, but I first took out the cockroaches, the rats, and garbage, then cleaned it with a broom and mop. Then I built a second floor. It was like a big shelf, a loft, if you want to call it that. I had enough space to put a small mattress above and a chair table with a TV on the floor and a hand radio next to my bed above. Also built a ladder. It was the best any man could do with a closet. Everyone was impressed. Roach actually made the audition and got the part of being in the now world-famous band called 
for non-blondes. They had a number one hit on the radio and a CD that was being sold around the world. So was Roach doing just that, a big rock star, no longer sleeping on the couch, obviously. He made his fame and fortune and went his separate way. It was not long after that that Becky was going to Mexico, and so were my bro and I. So there you have it. The gringo loco continues his adventures, ups and downs in Vegas, to the streets of San Francisco. It's just always something, right? I remember a a dark time for him. It was around when he found out his mom had passed away. And that's when we started to find out a little bit more about Sean. He talked a little bit about his dad and uh, who had passed away earlier. And internet was finally coming around and becoming a a larger thing in the early 2000s that we had access to. So when you started looking it up, you know, his dad did exist. And there were some uh, academic papers written by him. And his mom was an artist. Uh, so there were, the obit talked about her art and, uh, and at around that time, Sean picked up kind of visual arts. I didn't, uh, connect with it so much, but it was interesting how he kind of, it had a bit of Jackson Pollock. He took lots of kind of everyday materials, mixed it with paint, put it on canvas. And Sean being the hustler that he was, uh, got himself in art galleries. So every now and then he'd, he'd let us know there was a show and we'd go and support him. Um, and uh, you can still like find it. I think he's even been featured by the New York Times in Mexico. Uh, nothing major. I mean, I know he's not... Uh, well, just like most artists, they, they don't live off it when they're alive, right? Um, but right around that time, you know, it seemed like he got pretty dark. I got this text message from him and it it felt like a goodbye. I mean, it it was over 10 years ago now, so I don't know. You know, it's not like even, you know, when you replace your phones and you keep your old messages? Well, I just checked, and my messages with him go back to 2015. I'd sent him a message after I'd already left Mexico and I was living in another country. But, um, But this particular day, I mean, it was a message that kind of alluded to something, and, and it got me a little worried. So I called a couple guys that that knew him one that's really close with him that the one who uh who shared his story in spanish in an earlier episode and another who was you know on the peripheral he's my friend but uh he ran into sean here and there and he was uh, a little older kind of had perspective and i asked him to come with me too and we went to sean and he had you know he was married and he'd had kids um but he kept uh it was in the same kind of former tenement housing apartment complex where I had met him and he lived in a small house in the back there and I had an apartment with a buddy. But he that, he had long since left that. But he was renting like this little, it was kind of like a shack on a roof. It was a closet with a bathroom. And I guess he was staying there and every now and then he was making it his art studio. And he had found a bunch of tiles. There was a lot of construction in the area, you know, and he had laid them out. And it was really a rooftop with a, a shed or shack on top. So it was just cement, and he just laid the tiles on top. He didn't, like, install them properly or anything like that. So if you stepped on them, they were so fragile that they might crack. So I was trying to, you know, we're trying to walk around, not break all the tiles. We snapped a few. And he was showing us his art, and he was just like, hey, man, thanks for being here. Wow, thanks for coming, you know. And it felt like maybe he just needed that. Like, we were, I was worried for the worst, honestly. I mean, I, you know, you, you, how can you really know, Sean? All these stories I'm hearing about on these tapes that have arrived on my doorstep are, you know, he alluded to very little of it. You know, the bands a little bit, maybe some of the drugs, but um, nothing like mafia or gangs or big sales or <laughs> inventing crack in vegas all that stuff you know he he, we talk about sports and and stuff and and so you know the message was you know hey thanks for being a friend and 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 but it really had this goodbye tone and even when we saw him like 
and the one guy who came with me the the older guy that that we knew he he said something that really resonated with me that, that i'll never forget and he was like you know the the fragility of the tiles seemed to be uh a symbol for the fragility of sean in the moment and i know i mean i don't know i'm not really a kind of english major in that sense you know of like the meaning and the symbolism behind different things but that really resonated with me that that you know and uh, i felt like i i mean i can't i can't say we saved sean or anything who knows what was going through his head but um it felt like it was it was smart to go see him that night um and you know obviously he's still alive and kicking now uh and uh and i think you know through the through the old friends we have that that i'm finally gonna get them finally gonna get them and uh and as soon as i do well hopefully he won't renege (laughs) you know he recorded all this stuff uh, for for me to hear anyway i mean i'm not sure he wanted everybody in the world to hear but we'll find out when i finally talk to him so there's one one episode left one tape left uh and it felt like him wrapping up his his story or at least this this uh book you know this this kind of either chapter of his life or this kind of era of his life uh so uh next week uh will be kind of the end of of season one and then we'll see what we do with this once we find him um you know, I know he started getting into poetry too. Maybe there's some poems we can share. Um, I'm starting to find evidence of his art in different places. So we'll see what we can do with this. But for now, um, it's been fun getting to know Sean in this way, even though we're not talking. Um, and hopefully I'll start talking to him again. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, next episode, next week, same time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to True Story, a podcast by Gringo Loco. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sean Balin Gringo Loco Podcast and follow us on Instagram at Gringo Loco Pod. Catch our next episode one week from today.